So, uh, you already were introduced to Diana, so I won't spend too much time other than, uh, I know we were referred to as elders of White Bark Pine. She's also known as the Queen of White Bark Pine and a close friend of Clark's Nutcrackers. So, uh, welcome Diana Tombach. Yeah, it's getting harder. <laughs> it's getting a little bit harder to get up to those high elevation pines, but we've got the motivation. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about uh, a community that is often off the radar screen with white bark pine tree line today. Uh, before I do that, I just want to uh, thank Reagan Nelson for all her effort connected with the uh, Crown of the Continent um, five needle white pine uh, cause. Uh, she has been wonderful as a facilitator. She strikes an incredible balance in terms of moving us along uh, well, but also being open and uh, uh, receptive to various comments and needs. And uh, the balance and, and the way she's conducted this has just been excellent. So I'd like to give her another hand for what she's accomplished. Okay. All right, so um, let's see. Can you hear me if I back off? I have to use the microphone? Okay. Maybe I can remove it from its perch here, though. Would that work? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, so um, for those of you who aren't aware of the entire range of uh, white bark pine, uh, let me just point out that. Uh, White bark has the largest range of any five needle white pine here in North America. It's the broadest latitudinally and longitudinally. Uh, and I think we're all aware that at, in contrast to this broad uh, distributional range, it has a very narrow elevational range. It's a subalpine and treeline species and actually an upper subalpine and treeline species. And white bark pine uh, is a major uh, component of our high elevation forests uh, in the central and Rocky Mountains. And uh, one reason for this is that it's very tolerant of harsh sites and poor soils. We've heard a lot about subalpine white bark, and there's been a real flurry of research on the species uh, over the last two decades. But we don't know very much about uh, white bark pine and tree line. It's, I said, a community that has been off our radar screen for the most part. So I want to point out that treeline communities offer important ecosystem services. Uh, they influence snow distribution, uh, accumulation, and retention. And this uh, picture here illustrates this. This is uh, uh, Christina Lake, above Christina Lake in uh, the Wind River Range. And you can see that uh, these tree line communities are actually retaining um, uh, snowpack. Uh, as the snow is melting off, you have higher accumulations amongst these uh, tree islands. And essentially, tree line communities are the top of the water towers. And the water towers are what we depend on for downstream flows, for agriculture, and for wildlife. But we also know that white bark pine is experiencing some very serious threats, causing its rapid decline. Uh, the worst of it is the invasive pathogen, Cronarchium rubicola, that causes white pine blister rust. On top of that, we've lost a lot of cone-producing trees uh, from historical and current outbreaks of mountain pine beetle, and then altered fire regimes resulting in succession and climate change, uh, Reagan did outline these uh, threats. This is a current representation of the distribution of white pine blister rust. If you haven't seen this map, it's really quite stunning. Uh, we have it in New Mexico and Arizona, which most people aren't aware of. And in the past um, 15 years, it's been spreading in Colorado rapidly, coming down from the north and going up from the south. So this is pretty stunning considering that uh, white pine blister rust on the west coast was introduced about a century ago in the Pacific Northwest, and it has subsequently spread. Of course, we can't see the Canadian distribution, which would be a parallel of what we see here. 
Uh, here we have a stem canker in white bark pine, uh, one of the symptoms, rodent gnawing, of uh, blister rust infection. So uh, this is, I keep showing this map and it needs to be corrected because as Reagan pointed out, we're hearing from new assessments that in the crown of the continent, the infection levels are somewhere around 90%. We are the epicenter of the blister rust infection uh, across the west and white bark pines distribution. Uh, and it's been ratcheting up in the Pacific distribution as well, uh, in the northern Sierra and uh, the Cascades. Mountain pine beetle outbreaks have really devastated uh, large diameter uh, trees. In contrast to white pine blister rust, um, it's the cone producing trees that are targeted. With blister rust, by the way, anything can be infected from seedlings all the way up to old trees. Um, let me back off for a second and mention that one of the problems with white pine blister rust is that if it uh, infects branches, it will kill uh, the cone-bearing branches of the tree, and we suffer a loss of cone production even if the tree is still living. And then with mountain pine beetle, uh, the target is in fact the mature trees, and so we're losing cone production as well. And uh, uh, in terms of aerial detection surveys, as of 2007, at the epicenter of the mountain pine beetle outbreak, over 1.8 million acres uh, containing white bark pine were influenced by pine beetle. We had mortality. Another point I want to make is that we have found, uh, through the work of Lauren Berenger, a student of mine, and Sean McKinney, a former student of mine as well, um, that as cone production decreases in white bark pine, the probability of nutcrackers coming in and harvesting seeds also declines. When you get below about 1,000 uh, cones per hectare, and that would be a basal area of about two meters square per hectare, the probability of getting a nutcracker in starts dropping. Yes, at any level of cone production, you can get nutcrackers in, but with our observations, many of them had no nutcrackers at that level. Uh, furthermore, uh, the northern region uh, has suffered a major loss of cone production, particularly the crown of the continent ecosystem. And being out there, uh, looking at the proportion of hours that we actually sighted a nutcracker, there's a significant, statistically significant difference between the northern divide where we worked and in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. There, um, despite the mountain pine beetle mortality, there was still a high probability of seeing nutcrackers just because uh, there is a lot of healthy white bark. And that, that was as of 2008. Uh, blister rust is ratcheting up in the greater Yellowstone as well. It's 20 to 30 percent. All right, uh, getting back to tree line. Um, so we asked the question, what is the ecological role of white bark pine in tree line communities? And how will the spread of white pine blister rust and loss of seed production impact tree line communities? So we know that uh, white bark pine depends on Clark's nutcracker. And nutcrackers actually fly these seeds up to tree line and cache in tree line, and they cache in tundra as well. Probably a little known fact. Um, at tree line, we find that uh, solitary trees establish in these harsh environments um, next to nurse objects such as rocks. Uh, they uh, establish next to nurse plants. Here we have a white bark with other trees established behind it. And they also take advantage of shelter provided by um, uh, microtopography, such as steps and risers from uh, freeze-thaw action. And nutcrackers actually are attracted to these kinds of uh, sites for seed caching. So uh, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, the most common tree line species are white bark pine, subalpine fir, and Engelmann, Engelmann spruce. And these tree line communities are composed of a mixture of solitary trees away from tree islands, and tree islands which are composed of two or more uh, crumholds or dwarf trees that are often in contact. That's how we define a tree island. Their canopies are intertwined. And uh, a tree island forms when a, a solitary tree is established and other trees established to the leeward. So that brings up the question of facilitation. And this is an area of active research right now in ecology. 
uh, we've discovered that facilitation is often a key to community development. Facilitation is a positive interaction between two plants, and the presence of one plant increases the probability of survival of others. Uh, and facilitation leads to community development. You can get species established where they could not normally tolerate harsh sites, but they're able to be there because another uh, tree, another plant is, is sheltering them. So facilitative interactions are very important in stressful environments, and tree line is, of course, a highly stressful environment and one of the uh, centers of research for this kind of work. So there's a stress gradient hypothesis that's out there, and basically as the harshness of the environment increases and a tree line as you go up, uh, competitive interactions between plants actually transition to facilitative interactions. So instead of competing, there's uh, facilitation of positive uh, interaction. So obviously tree line environments are harsh, the soils can be nutrient uh, poor and unstable, and these facilitation interactions occur widely. So in 2006, Lynn Ressler and I um, discovered that white bark pine in tree line communities, and we're working the con uh, crown of the continent here, on the eastern front, we discovered that white bark pine is a major tree island initiator. It establishes a solitary tree, and other trees establish behind it uh, getting shelter because white bark uh, is able to tolerate these harsh conditions. Uh, we confirmed our initial sampling with a more robust sampling scheme uh, with her student, Emily Smith McKenna. And now we have to ask the question, uh, is it just the crown of the continent, or is white bark pine a tree line initiator beyond that? And by the way, this is the triple uh, uh, divide peak that uh, uh, Reagan referred to, also known as Divide Mountain, and part of it's on the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. All right, so we actually explored this question throughout the distribution, at study areas uh, throughout the distribution of white bark pine in the Rocky Mountains, starting with Wilmore Wilderness Park in the north, uh, Parker Ridge, um, uh, in Canada. So Wilmore is at about 54 degrees latitude. Uh, it's close to the northern limits of white bark pine. Parker Ridge, um, Gibbon Pass and Banff, Stanley Glacier and Kootenay National Park, uh, White Calf Mountain and Divide Mountain um, in uh, Glacier National Park and on the Blackfeet Reservation, Tibbs Butte, Lime Creek in the northern greater Yellowstone on the Beartooth Plateau, Paintbrush Divide, Holly Lake, Hurricane Pass, Avalanche Basin in Grand Teton, and at the southern limits of White Bark Pine uh, in the Rockies, Christina Lake um, in Shoshone National Forest. And um, I just don't want you to read all this. I want to just point out that elevation obviously uh, alters with latitude. As uh, you go higher, your elevation of tree line um, uh, is lower, just as we'd expect. And we sampled on all aspects available. All right, some results here. All right, in terms of white bark pine as a percent of the solitary trees out there, in the majority of study areas we were in, it was by far the greatest uh, percentage of solitary trees. Uh, there are just um, uh, just two study areas um, uh, where uh, it, it wasn't, one in Grand Teton and Gibbon Pass in, in Banff. Otherwise, it dominated as a solitary tree. Uh, it also dominated in terms of the distribution uh, occurrence within tree islands, and we only had two study areas, Parker Ridge and Gibbon Pass, where uh, it was not uh, found at uh, high proportions among tree islands. So it's a very important component in tree islands as well in these study areas. As far as tree island initiation, in five of these study areas, white bark pine was the majority initiator. It was the front tree and other trees had formed behind it, forming uh, tree islands. 
And uh, I just point out the proportional abundance of white bark pine uh, among solitary trees predicted its proportional occurrence as a tree island initiator. This was statistically significant, and the relationship was not as strong for subalpine fir or for Engelmann spruce. So our studies indicated that white bark pine was the majority solitary tree in most tree island communities. It had the highest proportional occurrence among tree islands in most study areas. It was the majority tree island initiator in half the communities examined. But the bad news, of course, is blister rust. And the bad news is that blister rust was pretty much in all tree line communities that we examined. Um, I'll go through this just really fast. Um, in Glacier National Park, Divide Mountain, and Lee Ridge, uh, we had uh, blister rust levels of 33%, 24% respectively. Wilmore Wilderness Park at the northern end, 1%, uh, so it's the lowest there, but it's there. And as climate warming uh, uh, ratchets up, uh, this will probably increase. Glacier National Park, six different tree line study areas. Emily um, Smith McKenna, for her ma uh, master's work, examined blister rust prevalence. She found an average of 47% was at tree line. Harsh conditions, and yet blister rust is expanding there. Uh, more methodical sampling at Divide Mountain and Lime Creek, you can see around 20%. Uh, farther north, given past Stanley Glacier uh, in Canada, it's present at Tibbs Butte in the Greater Yellowstone. Um, we actually would correct this figure now with additional work by Aaron Wagner. It's more like signal digit. We're uh, not quite sure why this has escaped so well, but in Grand Teton National Park, higher blister rust infection levels of tree line. Christina Lake at the southern end which is uh, fairly warm and dry, um, it's um, a little less than 10%. All right, so I just um, have a couple more slides here. I want to show you the implications of white pine blister rust at tree line. First of all, here's a model. Will declines in white bark pine alter tree line responses to climate warming? So we all know that um, tree line is a climate warming front and it's expected to, in to increase in elevation as conditions are mitigated. But we see, we predict that fewer seeds are going to be dispersed to tree line to begin with, with blister rust killing um, our subalpine trees and reducing cone production and mountain pine beetle on top of that. Um, and um, Blister rust at the same time damaging and killing white bark pine in tree line, resulting in a decline in tree line white bark pine. That means fewer tree islands initiated by white bark pine, less facilitation. Uh, it means white bark pine shows little or no response to warming in the upper tree line boundary and a reduced ability of tree line to respond uh, to global warming in the upper boundary. Uh, so uh, we actually modeled this. Uh, George Melanson was the lead on it. Um, and um, Emily Smith McKenna published the first basic model, but we've moved on and added some specifics addressing tree line using a landscape from our um, Crown of the Continent study areas. Uh, so our uh, agent-based model actually reconstructed that landscape and our agents were stems and branches of white bark spruce fir, um, dead stems and branches. Um, I'll try to walk you through this so you don't have to memorize all this. Blister rust infected pine, uh, white bark and red. Uh, this was spatially explicit uh, grid. We simulated the divide mountain landscape. Non conifer cells were tundra. Um, the site quality decreases, so as you go higher in elevation, the, um, the environmental quality declines for establishment. And um, facilitation uh, we had from rocks and from adjacent tree agents. And time step was one growing year. We ran it for 300 years to achieve a baseline, then 301 to 500 years to see the effects. Uh, quickly, these are the replicates. Baseline generates tree line community structure. 
climate change alone, rust plus climate change, mountain pine beetle plus rust plus climate change. The mountain pine beetle doubles the mortality rate in the white bark pine seed source. Okay, bear with me for just a moment. Um, so here are preliminary results of this model. This is the baseline. Uh, so we see that as um, just building a tree line, uh, this is the distribution as conditions become harsher. You have a, a, few, a lower density of tree islands. With climate change, we see an upward movement with white bark pine facilitating, just as we'd expect with good function here. But then we add rust, and that we have dead trees now, or rather rust-infected trees, indicated by red. Now the blue is spruce fir, and the uh, green is white bark pine, just as a reminder. So as soon as we get rust, we don't get the infilling density with climate change, we don't get the movement upward, and we add mountain pine beetle to this, and the density is reduced, and we don't get the movement upward with climate change. All right, conclusions. Uh, tree line communities provide important ecosystem services. White bark pine is an important component of Rocky Mountain tree line communities. In some communities, white bark pine functions as a tree island initiator. White pine blister rust is present in all tree line communities. Blister rust is the potential to alter community development ecosystem services in response to climate change. Uh, loss of seed production to blister rust and beetle exacerbate these effects. And uh, we believe that the potential benefit, benefits of restoration plantings of blister rust resistant seedlings and tree lines should be considered. I'd like to thank um, a number of folks for uh, their support and help. Thank you very much.